Welcome to episode 23 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian for 12 years and counting, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is the perfect time to mention that the ideas expressed in this podcast are my own, or when appropriate, I cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I would like to begin with a shout out to the other side of the world, to Andrea and the other school librarians in South Korea. I was also excited to connect this past week with several school librarians in Missouri and Kentucky via Twitter. I would like to invite any of you to email me with your feedback. As I explained in my last episode, email allows for greater detail about your library assignment, your questions, and your ideas for future episodes. Please feel free to email me at schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. Include your mailing address and I'll be sure to follow up and send you a sticker. Spent any time on Twitter this week, and you'll know that the Texas school librarians are getting left out of a pay raise, which state legislators have authorized for the school teachers. What I know of Texas school librarians, I learned from listening to a podcast called The Bibliodames. Dynamic duo Nicole Graham and Jenny Stafford are high school librarians in Fort Worth. Not only am I blown away by the programming they do, the presentations they give, and how much attention is paid to creating eye-catching and engaging place for their students to convene. I can't help but be jealous of having two librarians assigned to their school working together as a team. I highly recommend subscribing to this podcast, and you can find them on Twitter at Bibliodames. I thought this would be a good time to mention the ongoing advocacy efforts by school librarians in Michigan. The hope is that these strategies and advocacy efforts might be a guide or support similar endeavors around the country and by school librarians around the world. I've included a link to the resources in the show notes. The state organization for school librarians in Michigan is called MAME, Michigan Association for Media and Education. Be sure to take a look at the last four slides, which are full of resources and supporting documents and infographics. The Advocacy Committee hosted an informational meeting last Saturday in a public library community meeting room. An impressive list of attendees included Michigan State Librarian, representatives from the Michigan House of Representatives, Michigan Council of Teachers of English, Michigan Reading Association, Scholastic, Follett, Wayne State University, which is one of two institutions in Michigan offering school librarian degrees and certificates, school district board members, as well as representatives from a county-level service agency, which supports 33 school districts. The agenda included introducing our state-level organization, current levels of staffing in public schools, impact studies, and evidence that school librarians provide a vital role in students' academic achievement efforts to encourage more teachers to pursue a school librarian certificate, and finally, what we can do as community leaders to make sure our students are provided with certified school librarians in every school. This past Wednesday, I had a chance to see Lightning Thief, the musical, at the Fisher Theater in Detroit. I didn't expect to see many children as it was a school night, although there definitely were some kids with their accompanying parents. I was amused by a conversation I overheard during intermission. The son, who had clearly read the books at least once, was filling in the story gaps for his dad, and the dad said, well, then I guess I'll have to make sure I see the movie when we get home. I'm never surprised when books start circulating in anticipation of a movie release. However, balcony and loge seats for most shows in Detroit run at least $50. So watching live theater versus a movie ticket or streaming the movie at home is a particular treat. It doesn't take much to amuse me, and this makes me a lousy critic, but I did watch the show as a school librarian. For anyone who's interested in a professional critique, I did include the review by the Chicago Tribune which was posted this past January in the show notes. I'm always excited if I see something that motivates the kids to read more. And lo and behold, I had two fifth graders checking out Lightning Thief on Thursday. 
I mentioned I had seen the musical the night before, and the kids were really excited they were going the very next weekend. I will say that the musical Matilda, when that came through town, every single one of my copies of that book circulated for weeks. Another reason why I was glad to see the show is because my sister is one of the music teachers, both at the elementary and middle school. She's always looking for the next show for her summer music theater workshop or for the school musical. Given the technical aspects of the show and the fact that there were only seven characters in the entire cast, I don't anticipate schools picking up Lightning Thief for their next musical. I did want to follow up on my Dr. Seuss episode from last week. I do incorporate lessons with opportunities to work on handwriting for my kindergartners and first graders. The examples were included in last week's show notes. These were created using Google Draw and are available in a view only. You're welcome to make your own copy and edit it. I did mention that I use a hand-over-hand technique to help both my left and right-handed students. I should also mention that I always use a different color of highlighter when I'm working with my students. First of all, there's the novelty of using a highlighter. It wins over some of the most frustrated students. And also, if the teachers or the parents see the highlighted printing instead of pencil, the hope is that their student will either say, oh, Mrs. Herman and I did that together, or at the very least, if Parents contact me or the teacher, I'll remember that we worked on that together. Another simple trick to win over students who struggle or fall behind when we're doing classwork is to have some colorful felt tip pens with me. I let the students finish up using these special pens for pretty much the same reason. It's the novelty. The teachers and the parents will see that they were working on this with the assistance of the librarian. And now, the focus of today's episode, traveling librarians, both in and outside the loop. I speak from a place of experience. Five years to be exact, I've been a traveling librarian. I've taught in four elementary libraries for the past five years, and another year if you count the year I was a substitute teacher. In many respects, there's so much to be learned when you're a substitute teacher. And if you graduated in the 90s, like I did, this was almost considered a rite of passage. Thanks to a weak economy and nobody retiring anytime soon, everyone in my graduating class was looking at one to two years of subbing, including a classmate of mine whose dad was the superintendent of a district nearby. And that is why I jumped at the chance to teach on Guam. I was 22. I taught at Simon Sanchez High School for two years. Shout out to the Simon Sanchez Sharks. When I came home to get married, I found myself subbing. I had 27 W-2 forms that year. I traveled from class to class and across many districts in the metro Detroit area looking for the chance for full-time employment. And this is where I honed my skills for organization. I learned more about classroom management and the importance of multitasking and sequential thinking than I ever did in the semester of student teaching. I could expertly enter and leave a classroom and never lose anything or leave anything behind. So the challenges of really being outside the loop, let me say from the onset, being a traveling librarian should never be an excuse but it drastically changes our availability to support our students' and staff needs in person. Supporting our building remotely is something we can all do, but it is far from ideal. I am oftentimes reminded by administrators, we are not a school district, we are a district of schools. I will begin and end with this thought because it is both a challenge and an advantage to being a traveling librarian. Recognize right off the bat that every building is different. As soon as you accept that, half the battle is won. Do not expect what is protocol in one building will be in in another. In one building, we have parking spots designated for traveling teachers. In another, I can only park in the spot designated for the librarian. And yet in another school, I have a tag which I must hang in my rearview mirror, but I'm free to park wherever I choose. When it comes to supplies, one of my buildings is a free-for-all. Take whatever you need within reason. Another building has a walk-in vault, similar to something you'd see in a bank where supplies are kept, but you have to get past the secretary to enter. And another school requires that all the supplies were placed in a request back in last May, which is problematic when you didn't work there last spring and you are now starting in September. 
the laminating machine is yet another way in which the buildings all have their very own procedures. One school, it's a free-for-all. Help yourself and email the staff to let them know when the machine is heated up and ready to go. Another building has the laminator on from the minute the office is opened at 7.30 until it is locked at 4.30. Another building only permits laminating on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Yet another building requires you leave your items with the secretary or clerk, and they will laminate it and return it at their convenience. And while this may seem like minor inconveniences, the cumulative effect can really take its toll because it is really just one more thing that you have to remember when you walk in the door of each of these buildings. Recognizing that each principal will have a unique approach, set of priorities, and expectations for teachers. Be clear which administrator evaluates you and therefore needs to observe you teach. You need to have an understanding which building you'll be on for committees, which staff meetings you need to attend, You'll need to split your time for parent-teacher conferences, back-to-school nights, as well as evening obligations, such as vocal and instrumental concerts. And don't discount the staff dynamic either. There are cliques, just like when we were in school. And you will not work with every teacher, but you need to know which ones are the committee leaders, which ones are the grade level leaders, which ones have the ear of the principal, who are the rookies, and who are the dinosaurs who are just biding their time and crossing off the days until they retire. Sizing up teachers' personalities can be helpful, especially when looking for inroads into collaboration opportunities. You can expect a future episode when I'll go into much greater detail. Be aware of favorite seats in the teacher's lunch and at staff meetings. And I'm speaking from experience. Always be the last one to sit down to make sure you are not imposing on someone's favorite spot. And a somewhat related uh, note when it comes to the teachers is managing all the emails while working in multiple buildings. I currently receive all the teacher and staff emails for five schools. It's not unusual to come back to my email after teaching a block of three classes and find more than 20 emails waiting for me. Given the opportunity, I would ask everyone to be cognizant of just how often they hit reply all unnecessarily. There are certainly ways to organize my Gmail with color-coded labels and star designation. I do save a great deal um, to my building-specific folders in Google Drive, and I have become ruthless with the delete button. Make sure that you also understand who is in charge of March's Reading Month assemblies. What about the visiting author assemblies? Programs like One Book, One School. When I travel between buildings, sometimes these committees are comprised of teachers, and I'll advise or give some suggestions, but because I rotate on an ABCD schedule, I can't be presumed to always be available for the planning meetings. I am acutely aware that each building's PTO has a unique relationship to the library. We have nine elementary schools, and I have been able to compare just how much or how little support our libraries receive from our respective PTO. And because the leadership and composition of the PTO members changes as families graduate and move on, how much the librarian can expect from the PTO is likely to fluctuate. I met with our Scholastic Book Fair rep once, and she was very surprised to learn that not all the libraries were the recipient of the book fair profits. Teachers are surprised to learn that too. Again, every building is different. Another challenge, which is not necessarily being able to see my collection projects through to their completion. As I mentioned in my purchasing episode, some areas of the collection require a systematic investment of time. When my building assignments have changed, sometimes my collection responsibilities change. I'll work in a library whose collection is sometimes determined by another librarian in my department, and sharing a library is an episode for another day. Definite and obvious challenge to traveling to different libraries is the fact that building relationships with students and staff is really difficult. This process doesn't happen overnight, and I'm not in a building every day, so students don't see me at door duty regularly or in the halls, and I'm not always in the library when they are. It is one thing to join your teachers for a payday Friday happy hour, but when you work in multiple buildings, that choice isn't as obvious. Imagine getting an invitation to every building's baby shower, holiday gathering, and retirement party. And I'm out of the loop. 
It isn't enough to read the principal's weekly email to the staff on Sunday night. There is a great deal that gets shared in the halls and the staff lounge that I'll never hear. I usually have to have a safe, non-judgmental go-to teacher in each building, and I can ask them when I'm the last one to know about someone's family crisis or pending divorce or upsetting medical diagnosis. So what can be done? What are some things that we can do to facilitate moving between buildings? Many of the following suggestions can easily be applied to a librarian working in one building, And most librarians can identify with these strategies because we are, by nature, very organized people, and keeping our work organized makes sense, and it's worthwhile. And even librarians who are assigned to one library can get bumped and relocated due to testing, district meetings, or a book fair. We have to teach in classrooms. That's not unusual. I've taught in the choir room. I've taught in the art room. During standardized testing, the libraries usually house a computer lab, which is needed for the testing. Considering the following, and in no particular order, as best practices for staying organized. First of all, be methodical. Make sure that your setting up and tearing down is systematic. Arriving, getting ready for your upcoming classes, getting your supplies out, should all become a familiar routine. Your lanyard, building keys, and badge should always be kept in the same place. The same pocket in your school bag or backpack. Your car keys should always be with something you cannot leave behind, such as a jacket or a purse. Similarly, when packing up for the day, or when leaving for the afternoon school, be orderly about it. Survey your workspace, and leaving, your library should look as it did when you arrived. I rely on Google Drive. Color code all your folders based on the buildings. Digitize what you need and ditch your binders. One summer I did this. I pulled all my hard copies. I tossed the extras. I scanned and converted everything into a JPEG format. I then adapted and improved all of the things I still used in Google Draw. I generated digital representations for everything I need. I don't carry around visual aids. I simply create them in Google Draw. I avoid printing anything. This only adds to what you have to carry everywhere. I never print agendas or schedules or calendars. I cross-reference them when I'm using my Gmail and opening up my plan book. If there's something scheduled at a building, I make sure that I'm even going to be in that building that day. I only record the upcoming events on my calendar when they affect me and my building schedule. Planbook.com is an absolute lifesaver. And no, they are not a show sponsor, but I've been a loyal subscriber since 2012, and it is the best $12 I spend on myself all year. I did ask if I could offer my listeners a free six-month trial, and you will find a code in the show notes. The code is FREE6SLU. This is a fully customizable online plan book with an integrated smartphone app. I work seamlessly between a laptop and a smartphone app. It comes with plenty of YouTube tutorials, a support team, which gets back to me in less than an hour. It takes a little time to set your plan book up with your class times and to configure your schedule, whether you have an ABCD day or a Monday through Friday rotation or a flexible schedule. I hyperlink my Google Doc lessons, my links to YouTube or my Google slide presentations. I also include ebook permalinks and links to WorldBook and Britannica online for ready access. My guest teachers love the format when I print these out for them. Most of all, I can view and make notes for the entire year, factoring in our ABCD schedule, snow days, vacations. I also use PlanBook to plan ahead to what I need to do between my lessons and during my prep time. I use these time slots to include to-do lists and the first thing I do when I arrive in the morning and especially what I need to bring when I'm traveling. I also rely heavily on Google Keep as a digital file cabinet. I use the extension on Google Chrome as well as the app on my phone. I have labels for my school. I keep track of my budget for each building, books that I need to order, as well as school contact information. I have given Staff PD on Google Keep. It's really a game changer. And when people ask, how do I manage a schedule with four schools? I credit Google Drive, especially Google Keep, and PlanBook. These icons are on my toolbar, and these tabs are open all day long. 
because I have collection responsibilities for multiple collections, I have Google Keep help me with taking notes on my phone. I'll keep a list of books I need to purchase for both collections, while another list will address the specific needs of each of my libraries. I use Google Keep because I can't always access my Follett order when I'm walking around my collection, and oftentimes when titles are suggested to me by students, I need to write it down quickly. Because I travel, I create lessons which don't rely on transporting materials from building to building. My lessons incorporate books which I can find in all my collections. I rely on hyperlinking ebooks through EBSCO database and our OverDrive or our Sora account, so I don't have to carry these books from building to building. I make sure that I have class sets of clipboards so that when I have students working around the library or when I plan a scavenger hunt for my grades three, four, five, I don't have to carry anything. There are some other must-haves, and some of these are going to sound silly, but remember, I've been doing this for five years now. Color code everything. I have a binder which stays in each of my buildings. This includes class rosters, staff rosters, contact information, seating charts, grade book, a section for emergency procedures, student allergies, copies of IEPs, student accommodations. These colors then correspond to the colors I've designated in my plan book. I always carry a pencil case at all times. I actually carry two a larger pencil case with my favorite pencils and pens for teaching, and a much smaller one that's in my purse for after-school meetings. I like what I like, and I refuse to compromise and dig around in somebody else's canister of pens and broken pencils to find what I need. I label everything, my phone charger, my Bluetooth speaker charging cord, not to mention the library materials like our hole puncher, the stapler, the electric pencil, sharpener, the scissors, the tape dispenser, they're all labeled because they've also been known to walk away from time to time. I have a designated file cabinet or a cupboard in each of my buildings where I can stash my materials which stay in each of the buildings. I'm especially fond of these clear color-coded snap close envelopes which I use to move papers between buildings. I don't label them because I The purpose will change, and you can also see what's inside. I enclosed a link in my show notes. I also like to keep a fold-up reusable grocery bag tucked inside my school bag for unexpectedly having to move materials between buildings, and this happens when teachers make requests while I'm in one building and moving to another. I do set a timer on my phone, and I use the remote start on my car in conjunction because I live in Michigan. When I switch schools at lunch or I'm getting ready to drive home, preheating my car will take care of some of the ice and possibly snow, which fell in the three hours that I was in that building. Brightly colored insulated mugs is a necessity. I have a coffee addiction, which means I'm never far from my coffee, and my traveler is now cyan blue. Not only won't it be confused with somebody else's coffee mug, I can easily see it on a bookcase or on a shelf. And you need to be habitual about checking your emails before you leave one building and go to another one. Murphy's Law of Traveling Librarians means just as you've left your morning library, which has the very book a teacher in your afternoon library has requested. And always look ahead in your lessons. Figure out when you're next going to be in this building. Not only do I have the next lesson copied and ready, I also have a plan B one just in case. Most buildings require that you have sub-lesson plans ready to go. Having a backup crossword puzzle or an activity in reserve is never a bad idea. Always acknowledge your team in partnership with your clerk or your assistant. Learn how to lean on each other. When I'm in a different building, I make sure to CC my assistant anytime I'm working with the teachers. And be supportive remotely for your staff. You need to be extremely effective in your communication by checking your email often, replying quickly, but making sure it's thoughtful. I have teacher friends who admit they don't check their emails all day. Librarians who travel and service multiple buildings cannot afford to do this. We have to respond to staff and administration's requests, irrespective of our immediate location. And we have to do that in a thoughtful way.
I do want to share with you today something which I have developed over the years, and it is an absolute lifesaver. It is evolved from a calendar into something of a marquee, which I use to readily access a lot of visuals that I use on a daily basis. I'll include a link in the show notes. You will be prompted to make your own copy. It's a calendar of sorts that you can put on your smart board or your projector screen when students arrive. I do like to have uh, one slide that introduces my name. All too often, the students have had other librarians over the years, and I found that this is something that everybody appreciates. I do have a spin the wheel game, which I've incorporated into this slideshow, and I use this often when I have a few extra minutes. You can have the students spin the wheel and then answer the questions. I do include a couple more generic slides, and these are sending kids messages of what we're going to do today or sends a little funny meme. Sometimes um, I like to have the kids focus their attention towards the front of the room, and by having some of these on the slides when they show up gives them a, a sort of focal point when they sit down. I do have a slide in here about a cat who's excited about the library scavenger hunt. And I know scavenger hunts are pretty common as a, a library lesson. And at some point, I'll include my own scavenger hunts in uh, a future episode. Every once in a while, we have a Friday the 13th. So I have a slide about Friday the 13th. And I like to have that on the screen when the kids walk in. Uh, towards Halloween, I'll have a Halloween slide and a Thanksgiving slide, a couple happy holiday slides. And then at some point, I must not have updated my Happy New Year slide and my Dr. Martin Luther King slide. I do have a slide which is fun because my students get very excited about new seating charts, and this happens at the semester change. I also have a, uh, a Groundhog Day and a Caldecott and Newberry Award winner uh, slide, which I do put out when we do our Newberry and Caldecott lessons. Uh, obviously did not update my Chinese New Year because it is the year of the pig. And uh, I do like my Valentine slide because I uh, actually made that one myself. I found the image and then I added the wording on it. The Happy Birthday, Dr. Seuss, I've actually modified because um, it the read across America has downplayed the, as we mentioned last week, the connection with Dr. Seuss. And so um, this is sort of a one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish image. And, uh, and so I use that. The happy pie day. Uh, pie is not something that elementary school kids understand, but I have found that um, some of them, especially like the fifth grade students will understand what pie day is. And if you click on the link, it'll take you to a YouTube video of somebody singing pie. Um, I do have a St. Patrick's Day and um, Poetry Month and Earth Day. I like this next recycle image. I did create that, but it's modified from things I've seen on the internet about um, how libraries themselves are very earth friendly because we read, we return, we repeat. May the 4th, for any of you who are Star Wars fans, um, I usually am teaching on May the 4th and kids get a giggle out of that. I do have a last checkout slide because that is something which the kids need to understand is uh, coming. And finally, when my kids do have a 100% book return, I do like to have a slide that uh, shows, hey, congratulations, you guys have a 100% book return. And that's something that I use a lot in the last weeks of school. I do have some expectation slides, which are kind of um, helpful to have at the ready, and uh, I encourage you to modify those as uh, you see fit. I do an introductory lesson on damaged books, and I actually use damaged books, and the kids have to identify what might have caused the damage. I do like using an image of uh, eggs in a carton, and the kids are amused and they try to figure out why library books are like a carton of eggs. 
Again, I've included some slides in here. Some of them include my target goals. Some of my building pr principles like to have your goals on the screen when uh, you're teaching. The last slide has four images, a sunny beach, a jungle, a fireplace, and a snowstorm. And if you click on each of those, it will give you a YouTube, which is just a, a sound and an image of sitting at the beach or sitting in a jungle, uh, sitting by the fireplace or watching a snowstorm. And every once in a while we use this sort of as a treat to sit by the fire. You can sit and listen to the snowstorm as you read or uh, the beach, the jungle. I also included a link to an online activity called Wheel Decide and the kids can spin the wheel. And I included this because you can customize it to any sort of choices the kids can make in terms of perhaps checking out books in the collection. And it's a nice way to spend five minutes if you happen to have it. I do want to mention that there are definitely some advantages to being a librarian who covers multiple libraries. And one of those is that um, you're a moving target. It is very unlikely that you will chair committees or be given significant building responsibilities. Traveling librarians oftentimes don't have the same types of duties that classroom teachers do because they just aren't in the building all day and they certainly aren't in the building every day. And there aren't expectations that you will make up classes which are missed due to field trips or snow days. Because you aren't in the building every day, the idea is you can't be around to make up those missed opportunities. And as I said at the beginning of this topic, that when you travel, you realize we are not a school district. We are a district of schools. I am both nowhere and everywhere at the same time. I have the perspective of someone who has seen how many schools tackle the same challenge. I may not sit on building committees, but I do sit on district committees. When I contribute to a staff meeting, I can say with certainty how issues are addressed everywhere. Because I've had to be very flexible with my schedule and building assignments, last-minute changes and unexpected interruptions don't tend to phase me. I wouldn't say I'm easygoing, but I realized a long time ago that a great deal is outside of my control. I've embraced the idea of modifying my lessons and sometimes my expectations while serving the needs of my students, staff, and building. I would like to thank you today for listening. The topic of next week's episode will be, there's a substitute in your library. What happens when we're away? I hope you will tune in.